Welcome to this edition of Mox News. I'm Ryan Brooks and I'm with Juanita Ingram again today. She's back in the studio and if you didn't know, she's also Mrs. Universe 2022-2023. So we're just excited to have her on today and we're talking about your new reality TV show. Yes. But first, you're from Singapore, Asia. So, I mean, mm -hmm. how is the travel getting here? <laughs> it is 23 hours. Wow. Yes, a whole day and we are 13, sometimes 12 to 13 hours ahead um, of here. But I took <laughs> this new route. I think it's the longest flight right now in the world. It's 19 hours straight from Singapore to Newark, um, New Jersey. So it was actually very peaceful and very relaxing. I don't think I have 19 hours by myself at any given time, so it was nice. <laughs> wow. So what is the inspiration that you had just going into starting this reality TV show? You know, I think uh, I had clients in the reality space, first of all, and just seeing that there was a niche within the market that we didn't have a lot of family friendly content with black led cast. You as a filmmaker, a storyteller, you always want to look for the story that hasn't been told. Yeah. Uh, we don't have any lifestyle shows about people living abroad. You've got international house hunters, but that's just finding a home. That's not living. And certainly not from the black lens. And right now in our country, I think, it, you know, blacks it is very much a real thing. People are evaluating, all people are evaluating where do they want to live, where do we want to spend our tax dollars. It's a very volatile time in life. But around 2015, um, I had the concept for the show, we were living in London. And um, my world was just very different than anything that I saw in reality TV. And um, I saw how it was produced, sometimes overly produced. And I just wanted to offer something that was different and diverse and authentic. And I knew that if I didn't bring this to the forefront, it would never be seen. And we used to rotate houses and do like a, a soul food Sunday. And one day we were in the backyard and we were playing Beyonce and Frankie Beverly and Mays and the kids running around, we were barbecuing. And I looked up and there was Windsor Castle because that's where we were living and it was in our backyard. And so I knew it was something unique that people hadn't seen. Nobody ever really shows how expats or expatriates, people living abroad, how they live, and certainly how black people make that decision and that journey. What are the paths? How does it happen? It's, it's just something that's never been seen. So um, it's gold. <laughs> so, I mean, getting into just creating the series, you had to have a team to yes. do this. And I know that you own your own production company, Purpose Production. So just yes. tell us about that. I mean, how did you get into film? You know, it's interesting um, as an indie filmmaker and an indie TV producer, especially now that we're on the heels of the strike that has taken so long. And you know, you have to make a decision in your career. Are you network, are you indie, are you a little bit of both? There's so many talented people out there, union and non-union, freelancers and those who are with and without outside of network. I'm a member of the Television Academy, voting member of the Television Academy. I just finished judging for the Children and Family Emmys. And um, I decided to pull together, I felt like we were the Avengers, you know, and it was like everybody had their certain skill set and you just really have to pull together a team. Unscripted and, and sort of docu-series is quite unique. Um, you learn a lot. It was, it was indie filmmaking, indie TV producing. Uh, it was myself and I had a production partner at the time for the first season and she and I just knew that it was time to start rolling the cameras and in the beginning we would outsource and hire videographers and camera crew, but sometimes it was just she and I. And you get very creative. Um, there are times when you have a license to film in a place, and there are times when you're just gonna get the scene. <laughs> and uh, you get really creative and the ability to find talented people, everything from closed captioning to lighting and sound, and then the best advice that I was ever given was to learn everybody's job. And so I know enough um, to know what is possible, to know when to outsource, to know what I'm capable of doing in case someone doesn't show up. I've had a crew of 15 people. I've had a crew of, when we filmed during lockdown in Taiwan, we had a restriction of five people on set. That, mean if you, that meant if you had a family of four, like my family, there was one person. At some point in time, on some of these scenes that you'll see in season two, and you won't know it, there was one camera woman, her name was Morley. She's an extremely talented woman um, in Taiwan. She was manning five cameras, wow. all sound, all lighting. And that's what it took during lockdown because 
you weren't allowed to have anyone else on set. So you do what you have to do to get the scene, and that's part of indie filmmaking. Sometimes I look at these shows, um, and they have like 20 people on set uh, just from filming, 15 people to edit each episode, and I think about the quality um, of a show that we made with a fraction of that and what is possible and what is capable of really, but you have to know everybody's job. You have to know what every role is. Um, I have a lot of audio trauma, you know, <laughs> a lot, but I know what is possible and what's capable and you learn quite quickly um, and in ways that film school cannot prepare you for, so I'm, so I'm told. Wow. And I'm glad that you brought up um, just the whole lockdown situation. We're gonna mm -hmm. we're gonna um, tap on that in here in just a second. Mm -hmm. But I want to talk about the intensity of the attacks from last season. Mm -hmm. You know, um, a lot of comments that just did not perpetuate what your show is all about. Yeah. And um, you know, how were you able to negate those battles going into another successful season two? You know, I let it fuel me. I felt like I understood what Cardi B felt when she was at that award show that time. And she's like, you know, people stream my music and they leave negative comments, but it benefits me. Um, because in order for you to, to leave a negative comment, you still had to stream it. Yeah. And I still got paid, so thank you. And I allowed it to fuel me to understand, one, I wasn't prepared for it. I did not know that happy black people would be so triggering. I think sometimes we have normalized such negativity in the reality space, then when you see people that are happy, and um, I will be honest, most of the attacks were born out of the fact that it was an affluent black family. I did find it interesting when you watch shows like Real Housewives of Orange County or Beverly, Beverly Hills, for other groups of women to have luxurious lifestyles, it's a, an assumption, it's a given, it's not triggering, it's just par for the course. What was it that was so triggering? Because the majority of the comments were, one, my, my, it wasn't about my husband. Because my husband's storyline, which is truly his role in life, he is frugal. That is my loving way of saying he is cheap. <laughs> um, he is. And that is just true. And that's who he is. And so the luxury part, uh, the comments, oh, it's just another rich black family acting rich, uh, the negative things that were being said all stemmed around affluency, sort of soft life, luxury, and it being so unwarranted for a black woman. So the intersectionality of, of the existence of it being so offensive um, was interesting. Mm -hmm. But you, you know, I'll be honest, that's when you have to pull on the core of understanding why you do what you do and who did you create it for. I created it for young children to be able to see themselves in certain spaces, to normalize us just being, to normalize black people just being, to show that we are on a continuum. We're not a monolithic group. We don't all handle life the same, conflict the same. We don't shy away from conflict. I'm just not gonna flip a table or throw a drink. This is not who I am. Now I got some cousins, don't do it, um, cause they will. And it's okay, there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with any show that's out there. It's about balance and variety so that you're not perpetuating a stereotype and putting all groups of people in a particular light and how they navigate the world. So I allowed it to, once I, once I dealt with it, once, I, you know, it stings. I'm not um, a robot. Of course, I felt it. Uh, but I focused more on the people that had positive things to say. Mm -hmm. I think as creatives, you have to develop a very thick skin not everybody's gonna like, you could create a movie and some people are gonna think it's great and some people are gonna think it's trash. You know, yeah. It's just, it's everybody's taste level. The things that were race-based irritated me. Um, it was hurtful sometimes because I didn't anticipate, I mean, what do you, you not like rainbows and puppies too? Like who doesn't like happiness? Right. I was like, <laughs> what, what's wrong with you? Yeah. But I recognize the place that we're in in this world and sometimes what is what hasn't been seen as normal. They criticized the Cosby show for being unrealistic when it first came out. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, that's not a real realistic depiction of a black family. The mother's a doctor, the husband is a, uh, the mother's a lawyer, the father's a doctor. That's unrealistic. When it first, I rem I'm old enough, I remember when Cosby first debuted and they were criticized both by white and black people mm -hmm. as being unrealistic. So I felt that I was in good company to receive that criticism because that means that you're doing something and showing something that is so different that is challenging the norms. Wow. 
and I mean it's inevitable that you receive so many opinions on you know what people think and what this should be mm -hmm. but you know it's kind of pushing the sense when I was reading the comments I was like why can't black people have money too you know what's the big deal about right. that oh another black I'm like another one where's the other ones at? Like, it's <laughs> right? not even that many of us on it, there aren't even that many black led cast did shows that depict reality that aren't so overly produced to the negative um, that we can have the privileged posturing of saying, oh, is it really necessary that it shows that I'm driving in a Bentley? Well, that's what I drive. I've been a lawyer for 21 years. Is it necessary for us to see her closet full of designer shoes? Well, that's what's in there. <laughs> well, if you are watching Real Housewives of Beverly Hills or a show that is white lead cast, you don't complain about that. Mm -hmm. It is normal for them to have that. What is it that's so triggering if you see soft life in a black woman? Why is that so triggering for some people? You will never figure that out. I didn't make the show for them. I really don't care. I made the show for the grandmother that came up to me and said that she sat her children down, her grandchildren down, in front of our show. She didn't have to worry about the content. And when she came back, her children wanted to travel the world. I made it for them. Wow. So that I don't really care. Now I don't, in the beginning, I wasn't prepared um, for that type of backlash and the negativity that was race-based. I don't know why I wasn't prepared for it. I was just so focused on making you know, something that I felt was meaningful that pushed the envelope on the stereotypes that were out there. But everybody's not happy when that occurs. Some people like seeing us struggle. Some people like seeing black men emasculated. Some people like seeing black women um, argumentative and only handle conflict in one stereotypical way. And they like it. I, I remember, uh, you guys might be too young, do you remember the, the movie Django? Django, I do. Okay, so there's a scene in Django um, where there are man, Mandingo fighting, mm -hmm. and they're fighting to the death, mm -hmm. and, and people are watching. You know, they're sipping wine and sherry, and they're entertained. Yeah. At some point in time, and I sit on the executive peer group for the Television Academy for Reality TV. I'm the only independent indie producer that's there. Everybody's there. All the executives from all the networks are there. I'm one of two black people. I'm the only independent. Um, at some point in time, we have to recognize that it is entertaining to them. It is funny to them. But sometimes the way black-led casts are being handled and scripted in this unscripted space is to the death of character, to the death of families, to the death of marriages, to the death of integrity, and they're entertained and they find it funny. It's not always funny. It's not always entertaining. And it also is lazy producing. I love everybody. I don't mean this as a, and we have a call in a couple of days. I'm very vocal about it. I love, uh, my, one of my favorite shows before he went to prison was Chris Lee Knows Best. I still think Todd Chris Lee is, is amazing. <laughs> um, he's good television. It is a show about a man doing nothing. Do you know how much talent it takes to produce and edit nothing into something? Absolutely. To make it funny, to make it interesting, to turn the mundane of everyday life, to make a viewer want to continue to watch, that takes talent. It does not take talent to continuously uh, have your high stakes be who's going to flip a table, who's going to grab a wig. It is repetitive, it's redundant, it's lazy. Love everybody, but you know who you are. And, and I tell you this to your face, so it's okay. But it's, it's lazy. And creativity, I think sometimes we have to push the envelope and challenge um, why are we not allowed that level of creativity? Well, when, you know, Chicken Nugget, my dog, his name is, I, I try to make it fancy, Sir Chicken Nugget Ingram, because um, he was like a little chicken nugget when we first got him. But Chicken Nugget has a whole storyline. Is Chicken Nugget gonna make it into Singapore? That's, you know how creative you have to be to make Chicken Nugget's life interesting. That's talent. It's not that creative or that challenging um, for produced fights to be your high stake. Yeah. And I think we have to challenge um, networks. We have to challenge producers and production companies. If we want something more, we have to require it and demand it. And we want to look back. Um, you and a friend, Scooby, talked about mm -hmm. some of those triggering aspects on the Zoom call. Yes. And we're going to let you guys see that clip. 
Hey, hey. Juanita, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. Look, I'm just calling, I, I see, where, what, what, first off, where are you? I am at Marina Bay Sands, honey. I had to take me a, a self-care retreat from everything <laughs> and just get secluded somewhere and sit down. It's just a lot going on. I know you guys remember Scooby from season one and you know, he's the person that does all of my makeup, but he also gives really good advice. So you won't believe this because we ain't talked in a minute. You will not mm -hmm. believe this. So I had a distribution deal in the works for Where in the World is Juanita for my travel vlog. Um, all those hateful comments came in. People saying the show was too luxurious. Oh, it's just a rich black family. Another rich black family being rich. And I'm like, because there's so many of us out here. And <laughs> it just seemed, it was amazing to me, like all these comments were based on race, were based on people not liking to see positivity. When everything's based on race, it gets a little old. And the fact that this is jeopardizing distribution for a travel show is ridiculous to me. I took some of the shows and took them down because I just couldn't stop all of the comments from coming in on that particular platform. It was just getting ridiculous. But I had a distribution deal in the works. We were negotiating and they paused because they were like, well, maybe it's not going to be read that well. Re yes. You know what? I can't. You know, the the I thing can't. that annoys me the most about this is, is one, they pull out because it's not going to be well received. Uh, that, that's the first thing. Two, sadly, why people don't want to see black people with money on TV? That, that's just a God's yeah, Hello, truth. Hello. Say it now, again for those in the backseat of the pool. Right. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just one of those things where it's like, you're doing something positive. There's no fighting. There's no cursing. It is literally y'all just living your lives I, I, I do not understand it. I do I, not I understand it. Either. It's been quite the journey. I did not expect to receive any kind of verbal or racial attacks based on a travel show. Look, look at where you started and how far you've come. There's nothing they can do to stop you. Yeah. And that's yeah. it. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I just feel like never said the weapon wouldn't be formed, just that it wouldn't prosper. Exactly, and that's it, every single time. Stay every strong, time. you got this. I will, thank you so much for checking on me though. He's absolutely right. I'm gonna take a moment, reframe, regroup, and keep it pushing. Who can't have positivity in this beautiful place? The view alone is amazing. This infinity pool is just what I needed. I'm gonna go out here, sit in this water, and really give us some thought about the way forward. The show is about positivity yes. and inclusiveness and you love friends. Yes. And so how was, you know, making friends, being there mm. in an unfamiliar country, you don't know anyone, like how is it going through just kind of trying to decipher through who's good and who's bad? Are they good for me? Are they here yeah. for this? You know, I think it was, um, we really focused on that in season two because in season one you saw me finding my tribe and everybody talked about the difference between the Taiwan cast versus the Singapore cast. Um, Taiwan, we, we are genuinely, to this day, we are very close friends. Mm -hmm. uh, I just did a TED talk and Toy showed up um, and she was like my rock during the whole thing. We are genuinely friends. It is very hard sometimes living abroad as it is anywhere. Everybody that you meet and you, you assume that every black person that you meet is that you're gonna be besties. Mm -hmm you're not gonna be everybody's cup of tea. And so it's true and it translates over into this new environment that sort of makes you wanna push for friendships. But friendships at any age is hard. Kids are not the only ones that struggle with making friends. Tiffany and I genuinely did not hit it off in the beginning. In fact, what I showed was light mm -hmm. compared to what really went down. And you're not everybody's cup of tea and I was not her cup of tea and she was not mine. Mm -hmm. And I did not care, now we're cool now, mm -hmm. but even the whole crew, they like to do different things. Mm -hmm. um, I'm used to people that are very sensitive and listen to you, they don't. I, I love Regina. You could tell Regina something and you could tell she's not listening to anything that you have to say. <laughs> and so, you know, you have different personality types. That doesn't change when you move abroad. Mm -hmm. And you assume that you're going to be besties with everybody that you run across that's an American, and you're not. Some of my closest friends you saw uh, in season two were local Singaporeans, and we just hit it off and we had more in common. So yeah. it's a universal issue.
Well, I'm glad to hear that you and Tiffany are friends. I know that you guys had it out about the wig, you know. <laughs> First of all, who asked to borrow somebody's wig? Yeah, I just, that was an odd one. <laughs> it's like asking to borrow, to me, it's like asking to borrow underwear. Yeah. It's kind of weird. Um, I love her, though, and she was real serious about it, too. I just, there are different personalities. There are friends that share clothes. I don't. So some, for some people, that's no big deal. Mm -hmm. I don't do that. I find that gross. And, but I think it's important that you listen to one another um, and that you find some common ground. You don't have to be best friends. I think the, the way that we talked about it also is to really show how a lot of black women in particular navigate hard conversations and conflict. Sit down and talk about it. Let's get to the root of why things are happening the way that they're happening. There's a lot of trauma there. Mm -hmm. You know, she interpreted something that I didn't even say in a particular way. How many miscommunications happen that's real, that's honest? Yeah. How you handle it, it doesn't have to feed a stereotype. Yeah. It can just be honest. Yeah. Wow. And, you know, as an African-American living abroad, um, all your experiences, how has it been like mm. balancing the many different cultural values that mm. each co country is very... Um, partial to yeah and so you know balancing that and you know you guys move around a lot so mm -hmm. that and your relationships we just talked about friends and your kids um you know it's a beautiful journey because it stretches you and it makes you grow I think um so oftentimes we don't have to think outside of ourselves outside of our cultural norms and that's why sometimes as Americans because we don't leave America we are insensitive to the cultural aspects of other people that's why we struggle so hard. We have DEI and belonging workshops out of the wazoo um, because diversity, inclusion, and equity are concepts that are selfless, that cause you to see other people and value what other people bring to the table. Um, their sis and not only that, but learn from it. We had wonderful experiences from the indigenous tribes of Taiwan um, to some of the other local cultures that you start to learn about the world that is bigger than you, that your view is not the only view that matters, that you can have a differing of opinion and have the same commonality of morals and, and values. Uh, it's a beautiful journey, especially for my children. Their worldview is so vast and different than mine growing up here in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. I didn't leave the country till I was 27 years old. So it's, it's a beautiful journey. It stretches you. Wow. And how many countries, I know that you mentioned that your children have been to over 20 countries. Mm -hmm. I mean, wow. Can you tell us about just a few of those that you've been visited? Yes. Uh, you know, we lived in London for five years, so we went all up and through Europe. Uh, we had a stroller a tandem stroller that was so durable on cobblestone. I will never forget, I need to like be a brand representative. That <laughs> stroller got us through. We went everywhere from Amsterdam to Austria, Germany, Switzerland, Sweden. Um, there's really, you know, they've been to Paris a couple of times. Uh, I can't, it's easier for me to name countries they haven't been, th that they, let's see, yeah, haven't been to than all the ones that they have because there's so many. Mm -hmm. I hit 45 countries. Um, this past year, I have a goal of trying to get at least two more in before the end of the year. And so, you know, they've seen so much and um, have a real appreciation just for the world that they're living in. And I, I love the fact that they feel comfortable wherever they are. I think that's the beauty of seeing so many different cultures in so many different places. Now, your son, KJ, he's yes. quite the character. <laughs> he had a birthday in season two, yes. and he wanted a yacht party. Yes. And his response is, I'm a grown man and got to do grown, grown man, man things. things. Yes. <laughs> so yes. oh, we're going to let you guys see that clip. KJ, come here, baby. KJ's birthday is coming up, and I just want to see what he has on the brain. You know, I'm infamous for my parties. Now, she's thrown a really good birthday party in the past. Everything from gaming trucks, honey, to pony rides. So, I don't know what KJ has on his mind thus far, but I'm going to see what he would like to do for his birthday this year. Baby, I just wanted to know, what do you want for your birthday? What do you want to do? Um, I think I want a yacht party. Did that young man just ask for a yacht? I thought you were gonna like have a Lego set party or so a yacht I'm party. Only, I'm a grown man now. Gotta do grown man things. Really? 
a wow. A yachts. That's what you're going to have mama mm -hmm. get that together. All right, well, I'll see what I can do. Okay. You having fun? Yep. All right, I'm going back upstairs. It's hot out here. Okay. All right. Okay, yacht it is. I guess so. We're doing big things. We flexing at 12. That's what we're doing. We're doing a yacht for the 12 year old birthday. second okay. season you experienced a lot of post pandemic um, issues and you mm -hmm. also experienced closed borders yes and um, you lost your grandma so I, I mean just tell us about that yeah I think it still remains one of the most hurtful experiences um, in my life my grandmother and I were extremely close uh, I am named after her we are the same person I'm wearing sequins today because she was the kind of person who wore sequins at nine o'clock in the morning um, Everything that was womanhood, everything that was great, she epitomized everything to me. She she raised me. Um, and so the last two years during the pandemic, especially in Asia, when you're living on an island, whether it be Taiwan or Singapore, when they shut their borders, they shut them. Mm -hmm. And that was partly the reason why we had zero COVID cases, because nobody could come in and nobody could go out. And if you went out, you couldn't come back. So for the last two years, I couldn't come home and I couldn't see her and I can't get that time back. And so you think about living abroad as a beautiful experience until it's not. And whether you're incapable um, because countries are locking down and you can't go or for various reasons like for students or teachers or economically sometimes it's not feasible for you to just hop on a plane anytime you want to. It creates that isolation, that distance sometimes from family. And you can't, you miss birthdays, you miss Christmas, you miss graduations, you miss a lot in life. I missed the last two years of her life. I can't get it back. And she passed away. I was just lucky enough that they had just opened the borders up and they were starting to open the borders so that I could actually attend her funeral. I have friends whose parents died during the pandemic and they couldn't go back to bury them or to celebrate their life for two years. And so, you know, it's one of those things where you have to, a choice if you have children and you're living in Taiwan and you have a family and a family member dies back home, you can't go to the funeral. You can't go say goodbye. You don't get that kind of closure. I, I still count myself fortunate that I was able to attend her funeral. I had four days to go to the funeral, to come back and to get back inside of um, Singapore. I think they were letting eight people in a day and they allowed me to go and say goodbye. So it was fortunate in that regard. Um, I don't know if God allowed her to hang on until the doors opened that I could say goodbye if she had to leave. But I know that she's with me. She was a big fan of the show. And so she continues to push me. Wow. And you and your friend shared a similar moment, a similar yeah. experience. Your friend Kadia, mm -hmm. um, she's a military expat. Yes. And you know, you guys talked about, you know, how it is losing family and living abroad and having mm -hmm. to deal with those traumas and struggles. So yes. we're gonna take a look back at that clip. Okay. I got a call at work that was devastating. I stayed at work. Um, I took my moments and I kind of found a little quiet corner and, and did my crying, did my praying. And I realized I couldn't be selfish because she was going through a lot. And she was hurting. Right. I'm, I'm really hard at showing emotions. I am the one person in my family that everybody kind of goes towards and they think, okay, you're, you're, you've got it. You've got it under control. You're strong. You're always so strong. I've never seen you cry. So I felt like I still had to bear that burden of being the strong one. I remember telling her, I said, I don't want you to go, but I love you and I understand. And if, if it's time for you to go and if you need to go, it's okay. I said, I'll be all right, but I need you to come back and let me know that you're okay so I can be okay. Lord. And it took everything in me to say those things. I but I know she did. needed to hear it. And like I said, Alice, which, you know, her sister was there and she said, she wasn't responding, of course, and she said, I, I think she heard you. She said, I think, you know, there's a tear coming down the side of her face. So I think she heard you. I got the this is it, there is, you know, she's no longer here call. I went to work and I saw patients. Um, it was hard, but I also think that given the situation, because I couldn't go home, 
I needed to do that. I needed to work. I needed to be busy. I needed to stay focused on something else. You know, you said you got to go home. I and I didn't say, go home. You didn't get to go I to the funeral. I didn't go home. I didn't get to go to the funeral because my husband's gone. How could you? Right. Can't, right. Um, um, I don't know when he's going to come in. Right. I have the two boys. One's in school. If I go, I have the time working you know, with being in the military. They will allow me the time. They will make sure it's all covered. Mm -hmm. But well, how they do allow I go? you to come back in, though. You, but you're in the military, so right. they'll let you back in. Well, no. No. Because um, we're not here. We're here with the military side, mm -hmm. but we're here in Singapore on the Singapore roots. Yeah. So unlike other countries where we're at, uh -huh. this country is a little different. So we follow a different set of structure. And I, I think that's part of um, people think about like living abroad and, and it's, it's all mm -hmm. fun and games. Until, and, it's all, and it's all bliss and glam. Until. Until somebody gets sick or you need to get home. And it just depends on where you are. Like if you were in London, and you needed to go to America, it's eight no big hours, deal. Yeah. It's, it's seven, eight hours most, you're fine, you're there. But if you live like clean across the world, Asia. and you're trying to go from Asia to Jamaica, mm -hmm. it's a day and a half. It is. All right, so we first want to shout out the directors on this film, of course, Miss Juanita, Alex Aguiar, and Alan Ross um, for just creating a phenomenal film, um, numerous Webby Awards. I mean, tell us about the awards. Yeah. Wow. Gosh, I, you know, I stopped counting around 16. Um, film Between film festivals, um, we won Best TV Series just a couple of weeks ago for the Hip Hop Film Festival. We've been in Diversity in Cannes, Pan-African Film Festival. Um, it's just I, countless telly awards. Telly awards are like what the Emmys are for acting, telly is for production. Mm -hmm. And um, Webby Award winners, it's just, it's a blessing because again, at, one point in time, we had such a skeleton crew to be able to create something of this quality spoke to the professionalism of everyone that was on board, uh, from the production assistants to the editors. And this time, this season, I edited quite a bit myself um, because I had to. And um, it's, it was just a joy to bring to life and countless people that contribute every the closed caption guy was talented I mean it was just it takes that to um, be Emmy eligible so we were on the Emmy ballot uh, there are three steps to getting an Emmy first you have to qualify to get on the ballot not at all productions not all programs get on then you have to win the nomination and get voted on for the nomination and then you get those nominees are voted on again for the actual award but the first step is qualifying to be on the ballot and we were the only independent production in our category that made it so we will forever be an Emmy eligible show which is huge for an indie production. Now where can they watch the show? Yes so you can see the show on Amazon Prime if you're in the U.S. you can go to Amazon um, in U.S. UK you can go to Tubi now we're on Tubi um, you can stream it for free and um, soon for season one you can go to purposestreaming.com if you are in a country where you can't get Amazon or you can't get two because it's not global and um, soon you will see Susan, season two uploaded to purposestreaming.com as well for those who are living in countries that can't get Amazon and can't get um, two because Tubi is not global. Wow. Yeah. So fun fact, um, former vice president, uh, vice chancellor, sorry, Richard Brown, this yes. is this is her, his daughter. Yes. So, I mean, just <laughs> an honor to have her here with us today. And I just want to go ahead and reiterate that season two, it features uh, the good, the bad, uh, racial disparity, dating experiences. And we're going to go ahead and show you that trailer. Before you pack your bags and move abroad, this is hard because I don't even know where I'm packing to go to. I know Kinsley is anxious to find out when the movie is, but right now we just don't know. Toy and I met the old-fashioned way. He was instantly in love with me. Are there people for you to date? People are not really honest. That's why I'm just like, no, me and Keenan, we're going to have to work. We're going to have to make it work. <laughs> the Ingrams show us the good. Or black chicken. Lots of black chicken. You're racist against black chicken? I know. You why, know black why, chicken why? matter. Yay! Go Tiffany! The bad 
I love you so much. I love you. The pandemic took the last two years that I had with her. I have friends that I've known since I was two years old. Are we keeping you from having, you know, that kind of bond, that what? kind? You know, kids are not the only ones that have a hard time making friends. Hey. Hey. Oh, okay. How are you? Good. Go with the, go with the wave. I might just let somebody. Oh, no. <laughs> yes. Oh, no. And the unexpected of living abroad. Now, this dog license was rejected. Don't know what I'm going to do about that. My parents got really, really angry. My family was offended that I would be asked to represent Taiwan. I get tired of people jumping when they see me on the elevator. It's almost like a spooked kind of moment. Of cool. Well, she's not light enough for yes. Taiwanese. She's been called monkey. Called well, what do they girl. want you to be transparent? Living abroad as an African American has been eye opening. To be embraced by my skin opposed to it being a sin, I actually was really welcomed. We need to have the global solidarity with those women who are working in those factories. He came to the table and he's like, I don't want to be raised as a young black male in the United States. What do you want for your birthday? I think I want a yacht. Like a yacht party. Really? Get the VIP experience of living abroad with the expats. <laughs> Expect the unexpected. I don't know where his passport is. This is bad. So my production company is a 501c3. We are uh, mission-based in terms of the content that we make and also how we deal with the funds that we receive. And portions of the streaming proceeds go to benefit Dress for Success Chattanooga right here in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, it's an organization and a charity that helps unemployed women get back into the workplace. And so we are trying to empower communities and women um, as part of the ethos of the production company that I have. So stream away, because every stream means that you are empowering a woman and the people that rely on her. Wow, and don't forget, check out Dress for Success Chattanooga. It's right here in the Cindy City, mm -hmm. and we wish you well on your Thank travels you. back to Singapore, Asia. Thank you. And that's this edition of Monk's News.